between myself and your truth. Each cursed memory forever seeped through. Oh, my thirst for myself. Let me want it more Till I found myself Face down on your shore You say come to the river Oh, and lay yourself down Let your heart second service I said that's the first service and they all said good morning so I guess they didn't know where they were here or not interesting thing any of you wish you'd ever seen Billy Graham in person or seen him when he was evangelizing around and stuff like that Billy Graham you know who he is anyway we're having last year um, uh, CMA got involved in a program and we didn't get involved in it and it's called Harvest America and what it amounts to is on September 28th and 29th, they're having ev an evangelistic, uh, evangelistic spiraling, streaming, I guess it is, performance there. Anyway, we are involved in it this year as uh, participants. Now, it's not some warm and fuzzy Christian thing where Christianese, I guess they call it, where you go there and you group hug your other Christian folks. The whole idea of an evangelistic program is to bring people to the Lord that don't know the Lord. So if you would, right now, if you, if you would like to have somebody that you would like in your life to find the Lord, uh, perhaps it's a family member or uh, something else, if you would, you raise your hands for just a minute. And Ron here has got these cards, and basically what it amounts to is you just – He's going to ask you to put the name of this person on there. These names then will be given to the people that are running this organization 
we're not asking for addresses, phone numbers, or anything like that. And they will they're get together as a group, and they will pray individually for each one of these individuals to hopefully that they will find the Lord and that they will come to this. And what we're asking you, if you want to come there and just Christianese and hang out and stuff like that, you know, okay. But the real bottom line is if you'd like to come here and, and maybe you can bring a guest that you don't expect or that you, don't, that you know that doesn't know the Lord, um, please uh, do that. That's what it's all about. You know, we're supposed to be um, helping others that haven't found their way yet. So it's a good thing. Okay, let me get my blue notebook card out here. All right. Um, Rock the Ridge is coming, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, we, what we're trying to do is to make it more comfortable for everybody that's involved in Rock the Ridge as a participant. So if you can sign up out there for various things and help and during the day and stuff like that, that would be a great help. Uh, we would like, if possible, if you have a canopy that you could lend the church for that s particular Saturday, if you could bring the canopy by the church sometime next service or next week or something and drop it by, but please put your name on it so that we can get it back to you so we don't need a canopy collection here. And uh, we'll get it back to you, but that way the people that are doing the booths, you know, like the face painting and the popcorn and stuff like that, that they're not going to be sitting in the sun. You would think they're sitting in the sun, but because it's the middle of September, but you got to realize that this is stands, Rock the Ridge kind of thing. So it's probably going to rain. So <laughs> keep that in line. Yeah. Anyway, um, after church today, after second service, we're having a potluck. Please stay. It's for Don and Gina. It's pretty cool, huh? <laughs> That's pretty exciting stuff. And if you happen to, in your, in your travels while in this town, um, encounter somebody with old cars and stuff like that. There's a lot of cool cars in this town. There really are. And ask them if they are part of the Paradise Car Club. And if you can, give them a thank you because they donated $600 to Rock the Ridge for the... So that's pretty awesome. So <laughs> it's the kind of thing if, you know, you stop and say, hey, you in that car club? Thank you very much for the donation. It's going to go to the raffle, which should increase the money that's going to be in the raffle, which is kind of a good thing. Okay, um, <clears throat> one of the really coolest, coolest things I get to say up here, and uh, I get to say a lot of cool stuff, is uh, when somebody in our church body becomes, decides to make the, the plunge and become a Christian and devote themselves to Christianity. And today, we have a baptism. And is that cool? <laughs> Jesus himself was baptized. So that's always a motivator to me. If Jesus was baptized, why wouldn't I be? And um, he didn't sin or do anything wrong, but he told John it was to fulfill all righteousness. And that sounds churchy, but righteousness is doing things that are right. And so God wanted uh, us to be baptized. And it's kind of a display of what happened with Christ, the death, the burial, the resurrection. And that's what some of the writers wrote about, the being buried with him and rising. There's nothing magical about the water, but it's our faith in his salvation through grace uh, that saves us. It's God who does the work on us, but it's a picture of the, the, the gospel, the death, burial, resurrection. And um, Jesus told the disciples, go make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and I am with you always to the very end of the age. And then he ascended into heaven, and then the church began, and they did what he said. When you read through the book of Acts, when people came to faith, they were baptized. And uh, it, it was exciting to read through those conversions, and we shared some of that in our Bible study. And so what we're doing today is 2,000 years old. We're still 
uh, following that pattern that we read about in the New Testament and what Jesus said. So I basically have two questions for you. Uh, one is, do you believe with all your heart that Jesus is the Son of God, that he died for your sins on the cross, that he rose from the grave, proving that he's our Savior and Lord? Yes, sir, with all my heart. Amen. Um, Paul wrote that one day every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And uh, we have a tradition where we don't want to wait uh, to that day. We want to do it. We do it at our baptism. And, it, and it's saying, really, I'm not the Lord of my life. Jesus is, is the Lord. And would you like to make that confession? Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. <laughs> and now, because of your faith in Jesus as the Son of God and, and your willing to, willingness to make him the Lord of your life, I now baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of sins and to receive the gift of the Spirit. Amen. Hey, uh, find three people and say, surf's up. We have another announcement to make. I don't want to interrupt everybody because it just sounds cool listening to you talk. Come on. They need to bring up the main thing. We have another announcement to make. This one is more for the ladies. Ladies, if you are going to be joining us for the ladies luncheon this Tuesday, we are changing the location for this week only, or I should say for this month only. Instead of meeting at the church, we will be going to Margaret Tipton's house in Chico. So if you are attending, we will also be carpooling. Um, so if you'd like to meet us at 1120 here at the church, we'll carpool over together to go down to Chico to Margaret Tipton's house for lunch at 12 o'clock. And if you'd like to bring a side, the um, main dish is being provided, but if you'd like to bring a side dish, a dessert, something like that, that would be great. And if you need directions or any further information, or if you are planning on attending, if you could please let me know, because she would like to get a head count. And also she's invited us to swim in her indoor pool, so bring a swimsuit if you'd like to. 
and it should be a lot of fun. So just let me know if you're planning on attending. Thank you. Thank you. I'm tired 
taken chances on a road that never seen to be the one that brings.
only one person could have come to this earth to live a sinless life and then die on a cross for our sins. The Son of God. Today, we remember his suffering on the cross on our behalf as we have communion with God and with one another because we worship a resurrected Savior. to me now Try to hear from heaven, but I talk the whole time. I think I made you too small. I never feared you at all. No, if you touched my face, would I know you? Looked into my eyes. 
could I behold you? What do I know of you? Who spoke to me in emotion? Where have I even stood? But the shore along the ocean. Are you fire? Are you fury? Are you sacred? Are you beautiful? I just want everyone to remember that this is a safe place. And we've all had bad church experiences, but I don't want anyone to be afraid to share. Mark, would you like to share your experience? I guess I will. Ever since my church experience, it's just uh, really hard for me to feel comfortable. Thanks so much for being here at church today. Before we get started, why don't you shake the hand of the person next to you and tell them good morning. Good morning. Oh, come on, that wasn't that bad. I wasn't finished. Whoa. Hey, come on, brother. Bring it in. Come on. Oh, I'm not your brother, bro. It's a good Sunday, right? Here we go. Oh, I can feel your beard on my face. Come here, come here. 
Ooh. Never mind. Well, thanks for sharing. Hey, Hope Church, second service. You glad to be here today? Yeah. Amen. It's good to see everybody. We welcome you also if you're watching online. Thanks for joining us. Uh, lots of good stuff going on uh, right now around here. Wow, I just can't believe uh, so many cool things. Last night, um, our, our youth band, uh, Battle Cry, played at Remedy uh, Ministry on Saturday nights. It's touching a lot of lives, and they did a great job. And then, uh, of course, the baptism, so awesome. Then we have a potluck after this service today. Uh, to celebrate Donald and Gina's uh, upcoming wedding. You know, they grew up here. They have a lot of friends, and um, it, our church has grown so much. They just can't invite everybody, so we wanted to do something to just say we love you. So we're going to have uh, a potluck and a fun time after this service. I, those who know me know I rarely miss or go late to a Niners game, uh, but I will do it for Gina J and for Donald Darby. They're worth, they're worth a whole lot more to me. They're my family, and they're worth a lot more than a football game. And uh, their stories individually, I've got to be in on that a little bit, uh, getting to know them since I've been here, seeing how uh, Gina came here, then ended up being on stage using her gift. Um, I, I know that she blesses lives out there doing karaoke or singing in other places. She touches lives. That's what music does. But I feel honored to have her here uh, being a part of Hope. And then Donald's been real supportive of that. And um, he can do the worm like nobody, if you were here for the luau. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to celebrating. That's one of the great things about being in the ministry when you see baptisms, you see weddings, you see people going through different seasons of life. So I hope you'll stick around. If you didn't bring uh, a, re a recipe of what you brought for food and you didn't bring food, you can still do that. Uh, later. You can run and grab uh, something or you can uh, also just give a, give a, a recipe later for Gina, I know that would be awesome. And uh, most of all, they we just want to love up on them. I uh, am blown away by all the good stuff that God is doing. I've also been trying to do finish my deck, as I've shared with some of you, uh, before the winter comes. Because I put plywood down last year, and I just didn't get it covered. And I don't want another winter to fall on it. And uh, so... Um, uh, I came yesterday to the men's breakfast. It was awesome. Rick, one of our newer brothers, shared his testimony. It was so heart, heart touching to hear him share about how his life has changed. And uh, uh, then um, Mike and I met. We usually get together before the men's retreat and, and just kind of dream about it and stuff. And, and I kind of helped put a little handout together for him to help. But it's really off of his ideas and stuff that God's saying to him. And that was a great time to just get together with Mike. Then I go home and I see the third coat on the deck. After you put this uh, top coat on there, you have to put sand on it. And so I carried 800 pounds of, not at once, but 800 pounds of sand out there and then spread it all over that. And then you have to go back the next day and you got to sweep whatever didn't stick, right? So it's a bunch of sand. But it's kind of fun because I figured out I could park my truck on the edge of the deck on one end. And then I would fill these garbage bags and go off there and go, ah, dive bomb, you know, in the back of my truck and sand everywhere. It was fun. But anyway, I, I realized I needed to repair something, so I wanted to go in to the garage to get something, which means I have to take my work shoes off because I can't walk in Tracy's house with my work shoes on. It, it, but I can in my man cave. Isn't it funny, guys, we call it the man cave? You ever thought about it? Our man caves are usually outside of the house. You know, and so I'm going to my man cave barefoot and uh, I go in to get this tool that I want and I hear a. I'm like, not again, not again. I shared about last time uh, last week on there, right when I'm trying to get busy to put this stuff down, I'm still learning about it. I don't want to stop now. Snakes don't come when you expect. Have you ever noticed that? They don't come. They don't come. Hey, this might be a good time for me to come. You know, they they show up when you don't expect. And so I go, I got to deal with this. So I'm finding it. I get a flashlight and I'm trying to follow the noise. Little guy was letting me know he was here and he wasn't real big. And uh, but I found him under the shelf. But there's only like that much space on the semen under the shelf. And I had, I'm laying on my stomach in my shorts with no socks on and a flashlight in my garage. And I start laughing because I'm thinking, my how my life has changed. <laughs> I came here in a convertible from the Bay Area, Yuppieville, and I'm in my garage laying there in the oil, and I love it. I love it. You know, I mean, I'm not excited about the snake, but I love the experience being here. But I can't get a shovel under there, so I get a pole, 
without any tool on top of it, lay down under there. And now I can't see it good. I just know the approximate area. So the poor little guy, I just bludgeoned it to death, going, because you're so scared. and blah. So I uh, bossed our dog, boss of the barbarians, watching the whole time, curious, you know. And I finally get it out. And so uh, this morning, Tom brought me uh, a new gift. <laughs> he brought me this hoe right here. Because I broke the last one. It says on here, one snake killing machine. And I got to tell you, Tom, this is one of the best gifts I have ever gotten in my life. I love this thing. That is a monster. Yeah. <laughs> Things happen in life when you don't expect, right? You can't. You can't program the things to happen. And a lot of times the things you don't want to hap happen happen. And the things uh, that you want to happen don't happen. And uh, that can sometimes be a part of our bad church experience where we don't get our expectations met. We're disappointed. Things didn't go like we thought they were going to turn out. I know growing up in a church, I'm a lifer. I'm a lifer in the church. I took one... Um, a road trip away for a while and found out it wasn't so rosy out there and I was something missing in my life and I came back and I'm glad I did uh, but uh, when you say you grew up in the church that means you slept on the pews and you stole some crackers and juice in the kitchen out of the refrigerator from the communion stuff and uh, you bathed in the baptistry but uh, anyway growing up in the church I've seen my share of bad church experiences and being in the ministry for 30 years, I've seen my share of bad church experiences. Sometimes I've contributed to bad church experiences. I remember when I was little, um, one time my mom took me out on the back porch of a church, but there also was a driveway, a second driveway, so people could drive by, to give me a spanking. And for some reason, she didn't usually do this, I don't remember, but for, the, for some reason on this particular spanking, she decided to pull my pants down to do it. <laughs> So I guess she really wanted to make an impact, you know, and someone did drive down that driveway. And so I kid her now that I was marred by life from that, marred for life from that spanking. And she says, I don't even remember that one, you know, but that was a bad church experience for me. Um, when I went to church camp as a teen, me and a buddy found out you could sneak in out of your cabin at midnight. You can go into the mess hall and they have this ice cold milk on tap and they have these fresh cookies that these great church ladies make and you can go get ice cold milk and cookies. So we would do that uh, several nights while we're at camp for a week. Then one night we decided, well, let's go over and throw rocks on the tin roofs of the girls' cabins. So we go over there, and we're running back, and we hear the girls screaming, and it was so much fun, and we got caught. And uh, <laughs> then there was a time we decided to go swimming in the creek, a group of us, and we got caught. We weren't supposed to be away from camp, and we had to go to the director and meet with the director. Fortunately, his kid was with us, too, so we didn't get it too bad. <laughs> he just got a warning. But uh, years later, when I became a preacher, he was in the audience once, and he saw me, and I looked at him, and he's like, who would have thought? Who would have thought? <laughs> and uh, so uh, I remember one time, uh, I think it was around early 20s, before my road trip away, I was asked by some friends to play on the church basketball team that played in a night league there in Taft. And uh, some were churches, some weren't. And so it's a great opportunity for the Christian brothers to be out there competing. And so I get in the game. And uh, the team we're playing against is Bakersfield. If you know anything about Bakersfield and Taft, huge rival. And so they're the big city, right? And we're the little town. And so this ref makes a call in our favor. And the Bakersfield guy goes, must be a Taft ref. And, and we're in this circle out midcourt. And I go, hey, shut up. And he goes, uh, he goes, make me. And I go, okay. And I, I uh, got on top of him midcourt. And I'm hitting him. And I got kicked out of the game. And I was a representative of the church team. You know what I mean? <laughs> I'm sitting on the bench with my Sunday school teacher guys, older brothers that have taught me. And they're looking at me like, uh, and they were gracious for me. In fact, to this day, they're still encouraging me. Uh, but that was a bad church experience, that whole situation. And then I left for a while and came back. And then I've been back, and I'm glad I've stuck around uh, the last 30 years. And what I want to say to you today is, is not so much about bad church experiences with your expectations not being met with the church. I'm going to go a little farther than that with today. You may have come here, uh, maybe you were invited to hope by a friend, and you survived 
our chaotic system of parking. You, you found that you could find a place. We like to make it a little bit of an adventure, so there's no lines for you to park in. You just got to go on back. Go back there and find a place. And there is room. There is room. And you did that, and then you survived all these hugs coming in here, all these hugs and friendly people. And then you survived loud music and a loud preacher, and you still stuck around because maybe you, there's something going on, or maybe you're expecting something, or maybe something, you just feel like there's something going on and you don't want to miss out. And I feel like that uh, with a lot of us, we have this expectation. The problem is sometimes we have an expectation that isn't met, and how do you handle that? And what I really want to deal with today in the first point is Sometimes Jesus doesn't meet your expectation. What do you do? Not the church. What do you do when Jesus doesn't meet your expectations? Things don't work out, and you actually have a bad faith experience because your expectations are met. They're in a different category altogether of church expectations letting you down. Because the church can be into... uh, the human side, uh, placing, not, not, not letting you be the free or be who you want to be, or, or there could be pressure from the church, but I'm talking about Jesus now. What about when Jesus lets you down? There may be someone here today and you, 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 you said, I gave my life to Jesus and now things aren't turning out. And you, maybe you're feeling right now thinking about giving your life, getting your life back. You're wanting it back. Maybe there's someone here today who said, I gave my life, my marriage to Jesus, and it still kept unraveling. Maybe there's someone here today that you say, I gave my finances, my resources, my gifts to Jesus, and still the creditors are calling. Maybe there's someone here today who says, I gave my kids to Jesus, and I pray for them, and I pray for them, and still they're drifting. Or they're going through some things that breaks your heart that you don't want, that you would go through them for them if you could. And things aren't turning out like you expected, and you thought Jesus was going to work things out better for you. You know, one of the biggest reasons people come to church, because something bad happened in their life. That was part of why I came back, is my life wasn't going good, and I wanted meaning. I wanted my life to count. I'd realized that uh, the insanity of just hedonism, doing whatever you want. And I wanted a life to count, and I just felt like there is an eternity, there is a God. So I was at a time of being disillusioned, and I was open. But it's interesting. Not only is it one of the number of reasons that people come to church is because they had a bad experience, one of the number of reasons that people leave church is because they have a bad experience. In fact, you may know some people that didn't stick around. And sometimes it's not that they don't stick around in the church that you're a part of. Sometimes they don't stick around with Jesus. There are some of you here who have stuck around, even though maybe things didn't go as you'd hoped. You've stuck around, and you're glad you've stuck around. There's others that don't stick around. Some of us let different church experiences in other churches Maybe denominations, maybe uh, some type of, of synagogue, some other faith way. And we left that because it didn't meet our expectations. And now we're hoping for something different. We're looking for something else. Sometimes church doesn't meet our expectations. But what I want us to think about today is sometimes Jesus doesn't meet our expectations. Point number two, history tells us that those who were closest to Jesus had tremendous unmet expectations. So sometimes we fall into this, I think we're tempted. Well, with all this modern church, all this corporate stuff, all these struggles in the church, I just wish I was back there just with Jesus. But you know, those who were closest with Jesus got unmet expectations. Look at Matthew 16. I have it on your outline, or you can read it from your Bible, beginning in verse 13. It says, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? So what's the question of this conversation? Who is Jesus, right? Who is Jesus? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, still others Jeremiah, one of the prophets. Interesting verse, because all three of those guys are very bold individuals. You know, um, Elijah uh, took on all those false prophets of Baal. And Jeremiah, they 
He preached one sermon, doom, doom, because people turn their backs and they throw him in a sump and he sinks into to the, in his armpits in the mud and they come to check on him. What's the bad news today, Jeremiah? And he says, you are, you know, that was his ministry. And John the Baptist lived in the wilderness and uh, cried out, repent, turn or burn was his message. And he prepared the way of Jesus. Interesting that those three bold individuals, people were confusing Jesus with them. That tells me that Jesus didn't just float around. Consider the lilies of the field, Pharisees. That Jesus was not just some wimp that was just walking around trying to be nice all the time. Jesus was a boat rocker. Now he changes the subject. He doesn't change the subject, but he gets more personal. Who do you say I am? What about you? Who do you say I am? That's life's most important question for all of us. Who do we think Jesus is? This is a huge moment. Because what I want you to see is, because it, it really amazed me when I started thinking about this, is Jesus took on huge expectations. Jesus took on generations and generations of expectation. Jesus is going to take on over 300 prophecies that were written and circulated over 400 years about the coming of somebody special, some Messiah. He's going to take all of those expectations on his shoulders. He says, who do you say I am? The disciples are hoping Jesus is somebody. The disciples have left everything. They're following. And Simon Peter, bless his heart, he answers this quiz right. You are the Messiah, the son of the living God. All eyes are on Jesus. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So you have Jesus say, saying, you're right. I'm the Messiah. You're rocky. You're a little rock. On this bedrock truth that I am the Christ is what I think, because that's the conversation going on, that I am the Christ. I will build my church. The gates of hell will not be able to stop the church. As soon as we cower, oh, keep us away from the world. Keep us away. We're supposed to be hell plunders. We're supposed to, the church bust through the gates of hell to bring love, to bring hope, to bring good news. So Jesus says, I'm going to build this church. By the way, whenever the church isn't going like we want it to, we ought to remember who's really building it. Jesus is building it. We get to be a part of the process if we want. But whether we do or not, Jesus will build his church. Interesting, though. Look what he tells them after they say, you're the Messiah. And he says, I mean, what does he tell them? The very end of that verse. Then he ordered Strong word. He ordered his disciples not to tell anyone he was the Messiah. What? We are finally here. The Messiah is finally here. Generations and generations. I've heard about this growing up. My grandfather, my grandmother, you're finally here. And it's a secret? <laughs> we don't get to tell anybody? See, Jesus, people were already been trying to make him a king. Jesus had a different plan than everyone expected. Jesus tells them in the next part of that conversation, I've got to go to Jerusalem. I'm going, and, it, and it's a strong word. He's being led by the Spirit. I must go to Jerusalem. He's being led by prophecies. He's being led by history. He's being led by destiny as his Father's will. I must go to Jerusalem. I must suffer. I'll be tried. I will suffer. And on the third day, I will be raised. Does anybody know what Peter does next? He rebukes. Strong word. He says he rebukes. He doesn't like suggest. You ever get in that mode with God? God, this isn't right what you're doing here, right? He says, no, Jesus, you can't do this. This is not going to happen. Anybody know what Jesus calls Peter next? Satan, get behind me, Satan. For you do not have in thing to mind the things of God. You have in mind the things of man. In a few verses, Peter's gone from Rocky to Satan, you know, with Jesus. And, and Je Peter has expectations, and he's expecting a certain kingdom on earth. He's expecting a Messiah. And he's expecting, and he's got to protect Jesus. Sometimes we want to do that in church. We have our titles in our ministry, and we're, we're protecting God. We can't get out of control. 
We got to, who moved my cheese? You know, we're in charge here, and if things don't go right, we'll make them go right the way we want them to go, and we'll set goals we know we can do on our own effort because we're too afraid to step out on faith that only God can bail us out. I'm getting off the subject. Jesus knew what they expected. People had already tried to make him king. Jesus had a different plan than his closest disciples expected. Jesus tells them what's going to happen to him. Then he's taken in. He's taken into court. And it says, you know, I have the verse on your outline from Mark 14. The disciples what? They deserted him. The disciples scattered. You've got to understand, the disciples had a legitimate concerns. They had left the ranch. They had left the farm to follow this guy, this rabbi, and travel around with him. They'd seen him do amazing things. And now he's going to court and he's going to die on a cross. They have legitimate concerns because their expectations, it didn't turn out like they expected. It didn't turn out like they wanted it to be. Their dreams are dashed. Their hopes are crushed. Peter even can't quite stay away, though. He Starts to kind of hang around, but he still denies the Lord, remember? A probably middle school, middle-aged girl. Uh, hey, that's one of them. It's a question of association. You're one of his followers. Peter's, oh, no, no, no. Three times he says no. He even swears to get him to believe that he's not one of the followers. But yet he's still hanging around. You get the idea that maybe Peter's expecting something is going to happen. If I don't stick around, I'm going to miss out on something. So he's, he, can't, he can't quite leave it all together. You have disciples when Jesus is dragged out of the city gates and put up on a hill, and he's stuck on a cross as a public uh, display to everyone. The Messiah hanging on a cross. You have the disciples lurking in the crowd. Their dreams dashed, their expectations crushed. It's difficult for us to understand how they felt because we know the rest of the story. They don't know how it's all going to play out. They don't understand. Sometimes you, in your faith, you have a failed experience with Jesus because you don't know what's going to happen next either. So a few days later after the Messiah is hung on the cross, Mary comes to the disciples and says, he's risen from the grave. Anybody know what the disciples say? You're crazy. You're nuts. Typical guys, right? Don't want to listen to the women. You're crazy. Then John talks about John and Peter run into the, the uh, tomb. Peter, though, busts in. Peter may be history. A lot of historians say Peter's the first one to look eye, eyeball to eyeball to the resurrected Savior. He's actually, we know he's one of the first ones. He sees a resurrected Savior. Peter was right. Jesus was the Messiah. But he wasn't the Ma Messiah that Peter expected. Jesus was sent from God. Peter was right about that. But he didn't come to do what Peter thought that one sent from God would come to do. Peter was right. He came to do the will of the Father, but the will of the Father and the will of Peter were two different things. Peter was right. Jesus did come to, to establish a kingdom on earth or a big a kingdom that would reign, but it would be far different than what Peter expected or imagined. In fact, it was beyond his wildest expectations. And number three is the disciples learned that a resurrected Savior is far better than an earthly king. A resurrected Savior is far better than an earthly king. See, we sometimes, I don't even use that terminology a lot around people. Uh, it, it's not because I'm embarrassed. It just sounds so churchy, and I don't think people need, know what it means, but we need a Savior. He is our, our Savior. We just sang about how we're not worthy. We all sin. That's why I hate when, when we present as Christians like we've all got it together. Three seconds ago, we were outside of the kingdom, and now all of a sudden we've got it all together. What a joke. The only reason, we're all broken. We all fall short. Is there anyone here that never makes a mistake? I ask that continuously because I love our culture that we're real about that, and I don't ever want it to change because if this place has to be perfect, I can't be here. But we have a Savior. A resurrection Savior is a lot better than an earthly king. 
Kings, earthly kings, come and go. Resurrection saviors don't come and go. And then something happens. Not long after the resurrection, there's a defining moment for Peter. This would mark Peter for the rest of his life. First of all, through the Holy Spirit coming upon them, he's preaching, and we have his recorded message in Acts 2. The church begins, explodes, about 3,000 are baptized. And then in chapter 4, Peter and John are going to the temple to pray. They heal someone on the way. They do a miracle. People gather. Peter uses an opportunity. He preaches Jesus. About 5,000 men come to the Lord. Now Peter, defining moment. He's thrown in jail. Then he's called in on the carpet before the Sanhedrin, the Jewish ruling council the very same guys who tried and convicted Jesus. Now there's another question of association. This time it's not coming from a middle school girl outside while the court's going on. It's coming from Caiaphas. It's coming from the high priest. It's coming from the same people that convicted Jesus. What are you going to do, Peter? And they ask this question, by what power or name did you do this? He denied him before. Defining moment, look what he says. Know this, you and all the people of Israel. It is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Sometimes the world say, says, well, that, that Jesus is too narrow. If he's a resurrected Savior, he can be narrow. <laughs> if he's the creator of the universe, the problem is not him being too narrow. The problem is my God's too small in my mind when I say that. When you come to see who he is, then you gladly admit he's the only religious leader in history that's got an empty grave. Peter had seen too much. He didn't know what to expect next, but he knew one thing. He'd learn one thing, that regardless of the circumstances, he wasn't following just an earthly king. He was following a resurrected Savior who came to be the Savior of the entire world. Peter wasn't going to shrink back. He didn't know how God was going to play it out. He, he'd learn one thing, that you can't tell what God's going to do. Jesus doesn't do what you expect. But he wasn't going to back off. He was going to stick around. Some of you today may have legitimate concerns in your position in life, in a category that you find yourself in, in circumstances. And you're you're disappointed maybe because things haven't turned out like you expected. Your career, your family, your health, whatever it is, things haven't gone like you thought. And you're you're following Jesus hasn't really changed all those circumstances maybe like you thought it would. And in this context, you show up to church and you're wondering, what's God doing? And I'll tell you, if Peter was here, you know what he'd say? If Peter was here, his message to us in life with our hopes have been, when our hopes have been dashed and our dreams have been crushed, I think Peter's message is stick around. Stick around. God's not done yet. He's not done yet. Peter's seen too much. He's learned there's more to the story. He knows from experience the same is true for you and the same is true for me. Every one of us runs into that at some point in following Jesus. I've seen that in my life. I'm a lifer. I've seen that, that every one of us as a follower will go through things that that don't happen like we want them to happen when we stick around. In fact, I believe, uh, now that I'm an old dude, (laughs) looking back, I believe sometimes the worst things that we don't want, that we didn't expect, are the greatest opportunities. They're beyond our wild expectations. He didn't seem to be working in our life in some situation. If you could hear from Peter, his perspective, who almost missed out, but stuck around, was glad he stuck around, he'd listen to your story and my story, and he'd say, you're right, that's heartbreaking. I don't understand it either. It's so difficult for us to understand why God prevents some things that we want to happen, and he permits some things that we don't want to happen, but stick around. He's not done yet. Don't don't let unmet expectations rob you from the greatest opportunity in your life. Don't let unmet expectations cheat you from seeing what God wants to do in your life. Because 
What God wants to do in your life is ultimately better than your expectations. It's so much better. And I look back there and I've seen it over and over. He did more than I even thought when I was in the middle of it. Poor me or whatever. It wasn't going like I thought. I thought, what a, what a waste. But I, I'm not giving up. I've seen the resurrected Savior. I'm to keep falling. I look back. Wow, look what he did. Look what he's doing. I bet Peter was glad he stuck around. Don't leave the movie because the plot's not shaping out like he thought. Stay to the movie. Don't quit reading the book because you're in a difficult chapter right now. Read to the end. Let it play out because God does things that are greater than we can even dream or, or imagine. You're surrounded by people who have who've had expectations dashed. They've had their hopes crushed. But they're on the other side of hanging in there. They stuck around. And they would say to you, wait and see. You just Wait and see. Keep following. Keep following and giving up your marriage to God. Or if you're single, give up your, your singleness, your loneliness, or any struggles. Work on being that whole person. Give it up to God. Keep giving your resources to God. Keep giving your relationships to God. Keep following God wherever God's calling. Give your family up to God. He's not done yet. And he usually does a lot better than we can expect. He just doesn't do it on our timing. Do you know what God wants to do in your life? Do you know what God is willing to do? Peter thought he knew, but he was wrong. See, Jesus rarely does what we expect of him. That's, that's really what the truth is. If you read through the gospel, he's all the time not doing what people expect him to do. Will following Jesus turn out to be what you expected? No, but eventually, I believe this with all my heart and my soul, it will be better. It will be better. Stick around. Let's pray together. Father, I pray for us to rise above whatever our circumstances are, to get the perspective that we see from Peter and, and see the resurrected Savior and to know that you're better, uh, that you're above and beyond our expectations and that you have a plan. I know that there's not one person in this room that you don't have a plan. There's nobody in here that's a mistake or, or too far gone. You have a plan for every single one of us and you work in different ways. God, help us to realize that. Now, I know there's probably some... In this size audience, there's some people going through some real tough stuff. And I don't want to minimize that in any way. I just want to encourage them and myself to look at something greater. You, Father, you're so much greater than our temporary challenges. So help us to trust in you to do more than we can ask or imagine. And I pray you get all the glory and the credit. In the name of our resurrected Savior, Jesus, amen. Let's stand together and celebrate God. Before we play, um, I want to introduce you to the newest member of our band, and that's his piano. And um, <laughs> it's named Yama, Yama Pala. <laughs> no, um, I, <laughs> as my wife will tell you, I'm a big, I, I serve Craigslist probably nonstop. Anyway, um, this was on Craigslist for 100 bucks, and I thought, what a great deal. So I emailed the person and we went, kind of went back and forth about it and um, within the conversation I said it was going to go to a church and uh, she said well it's leaving a church so it might as well go to another church if that's the case you can have it <laughs> and so yeah exactly so Thursday she came in this is a double whammy so Thursday she came in during uh, the youth night and she delivered it and um, she came in the church and she said, how's your youth, youth group? Um, we're trying to put one together. It's just really hard to get it off the ground. She came in here and she said, my goodness, the, the, the vibe in the room was just insane. She just, she couldn't believe it. She just thought it was the coolest thing. So you guys are doing an awesome job. Amen. So let's try and play this thing. Amen. Oh, Dave, you got it. I'm sorry. I've got like eight hours sleep in the last three days, so I'm really sorry.
celebrate giving because you taught us that life is not about holding on it's about turning loose if there's someone going through a hard time financially lord i just pray that uh, they give you your heart and focus on that and um, their resources will follow uh, if there's someone here visiting um, god i just pray they realize this service is our gift for them lord i pray that you will help us to grow and that we will be a force of hope on the ridge and beyond until jesus comes and that you get all the credit in jesus name amen, amen. Hey, before we give, I wanted to let you know we're, uh, we'll be getting the table set up, and then we'll have a great time. Hope you can stick around for the potluck. And also, uh, what is our purpose? How do you do that? Love God, love people. Thanks for being here. Have an awesome week. Remember, in Christ, we always have hope. Yeah.
does your heart bleed for a fool like me? Why your glory leave to set my spirit free? How could you love the hands that nailed you there? Why would you die? Why do you even care? Thank you. 